What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. I am pumped for today's episode because my special guest is a two-time Golf Digest top 50 golf fitness professional and trainer. She has become highly sought after for her unique approach to training, which combines nutrition, training, and lifestyle hacks to alter body composition and optimize metabolism. Ali Gilbert, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I have to add on to my bio, which I have on my Instagram, is that I normalize boner talk because that's kind of what I'm known for. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Yeah, we'll be getting stuck into that, obviously, in today's conversation, which I'm definitely looking forward to. But um, maybe do you want to start with like a little bit about your journey, Ali? Like, let my listeners know a little bit about yourself. How'd you get started and what do you focus on today? Sure. Yeah. I'm a fitness professional, which I often get misunderstood for being some sort of doctor or healthcare practitioner, which is fine. Cause I always joke that like, I'm not a doctor, but I just play one on social media because I heavily blur the lines that we're not supposed to blur, but whatever. Um, so I've been a strength coach slash fitness professional for 20 years. It was my major in college exercise science and Basically, my specialty is in men's health. And the way I landed there was from what you said, golf fitness. So specializing in golf fitness brought me all male clientele because only guys really cared about their golf swing. And the place I grew up in the United States, in Connecticut, we had nine golf clubs in my town. So it was obviously the right decision for me from a career standpoint to specialize in that because it was oh, I still get to train athletes, but they could afford to train and they take it seriously and they're type A. And I love dealing with like type A, like people who get to work. So started training mostly guys, realized guys never go to the doctor and they basically suffered from just as much misinformation, if not more surrounding hormones and hormone replacement that women do as well. And Basically, I just kind of ran with that um, for the last like eight to 10 years. So now I coach men remotely doing nutrition and fitness and then kind of align them with practitioners who know what they're doing, such as our friend Dave Lee and other people in the United States that can prescribe TRT and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a, a weird marriage between like golf fitness and men's health, but that's how that came about. Cause everyone always asks like, how did you land with that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, it's an amazing journey. And I, um, yeah, really respect what you're doing. I've been having a look at your Instagram posts and I've heard a lot about you in terms of the things you talk about. So I guess maybe we can start out with what are some of the common struggles that you see with men these days in terms of like hormonal health? So a lot of them, I think, don't really know exactly what they're supposed to be feeling or sensing when they have low testosterone, because at least over here, and I know that over there, the difficulty in obtaining a prescription for it alone can be enough to deter somebody away from actually talking about it. So the first step is identifying, do I have an actual issue, which I commend any man for doing, because it takes a lot of balls for them to be like, something's wrong. I need to do something about it because men don't go to the doctor ever unless it's an emergency or has to do, you know, with their penis. So um, I think trying to understand where their symptoms are coming from is probably the most important thing because they think, oh, well, I feel kind of depressed or I don't feel as much drive or a passion for my job or my family or my relationship as I once did. Why is that? And it really messes with their head because they feel almost less of a man than they're willing to admit. And those are the difficult conversations that I have with them because there's a lot of guys that struggle with erectile issues or sexual health issues, and they don't know why. And they're in their twenties. And a lot of it stems from childhood or just one bad relationship that maybe they had when they were a teenager. And I always bring that up because they don't connect the dots. I don't think a lot of people do like childhood trauma of any kind really, you know, comes to fruition when we're adults. But, and then before, you know, we realize what happened, we're like, oh yeah, that totally affected me my entire life. And now I realize why. So that's kind of like a long winded answer, but I think that's kind of the root of where a lot of this stems from, because at the end of the day, it's a stressor. 
and stressors are really what impede somebody's ability to produce hormones at an optimal level. And it also will suppress their ability to, you know, perform at their potential, whether it's in the gym or the bedroom or anywhere, really. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I guess, like the action plan for like, let's say young men, like in their twenties and maybe they've gone to their doctor, like what does that typical process look like for them? And like, how do you see it being so completely flawed? So in the U S at least our labs have this arbitrary range that has decreased over the last few decades. And we measure in nanograms per deciliter, and it used to be like 350 to you know 11 or 1500. And now I released a course on this, and one of my slides was LabCorp, Bioreference, and Quest, and their new ranges. And Bioreference had the lowest, starting at 193. Which, as you can imagine, like if you're a 25 year old and your testosterone's 194, you're gonna be like, dude you're all right. Have a nice day. And I'm like, Oh my God. And I actually talked to a man this morning. He's 26 years old. His testosterone was 280 and he was told he's fine. Yeah. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, and he said, yeah, the doctor said that I'm normal. So there's really not much that we can do. And these are guys that will do all the right things in every other aspect of their life their lifestyle, sleep, nutrition, training, like they'll nail it. And yet still they're plagued with these low T levels. And so their first question is what is wrong with me or what am I doing wrong? And it really, it's neither, it's neither that it's really the environmental factors, but also, you know, everything that they're up against as far as stress in life and everything. So they feel something's wrong with them or they have a flaw and that makes them even less likely to say something like, I feel something's wrong. And usually they don't look to get tested unless it's something they've read or somebody, you know, pushes them to get tested, but very rarely it's not usually in routine. Like when you go to get your yearly checkup, they don't test hormones because why would they, you know, our insurance and our healthcare system doesn't really care about being, you know, optimal. They just want to make sure you don't die. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And also as far as that process there, let's say, you know, guys doing everything right, like maybe eating well, training hard, but their T is very low. And let's say they're in their mid twenties. What about some other stealth and underlying causes there? Like maybe do they have like a varicocele or, you know, these other hidden causes, maybe do you want to expand upon those? Yeah, I think um, I've had a few guys who have a varicocele and then when I push them to go get it checked out or maybe get surgery or something, then they're like, Oh, something can be done about this. You know, they have no idea. And a lot of the times too. And I I think Dave has expanded on this where younger guys, when they're born, they're born with undescended testicles or they have one descended testicle, which will greatly impact their ability to produce testosterone because babies are being born now with the anogenital distance is a lot shorter, which is usually predominant in females. And now that's becoming very predominant in males. And Mm -hmm. I talk about that as like the AG distance because that's my initials. And so now people will associate me with the anal genital distance. Thank you. So I tell them, you know, instead of like measuring, you know, if your index finger is longer or not, you guys can go home and now, you know, take a mirror and measure the distance from your, your scrotum to your anus. We just use a ruler for that. Like what's the process there? No, I don't, I don't know if that would bend appropriately. I think a measuring tape or maybe like the, the tape that you use to take your own um, body measurements that self uh, clicks and stuff, (laughs) or maybe there's an app for that. I don't know. I haven't found it yet, (laughs) but I think those are actually things that no one considers because they don't realize like we're in a sperm production crisis, you know, Mm -hmm. on all of earth and guys are being born with less exposure to testosterone and more exposure to estrogens, you know, specifically xenoestrogens and phthalates that all of a sudden here you are. And you have no idea that this is something that you were born with. And it's very difficult to do anything about it, you know, when you're in the womb, cause you can't talk or anything. So, you know, it puts tremendous pressure on the mother. Cause it's like, I mean, if you were a pregnant woman, like you would be afraid to leave the house because of all these exposures and 
to know that you can affect your, your son's sperm production while you're pregnant with him. Like it's crazy. Yeah. What about when it comes to, I guess, like optimizing male sexual health? Cause I know you mentioned, um, you know, you, you like to talk boners and things like that. So let's sort of get that discussion going here. First of all, my question is where high testosterone does not always equal high sex drive. So maybe do you want to expand upon that? A lot of times when sex drive is low, guys think automatically testosterone. And they think that that's the only thing that is basically affecting their libido being up or down. And the approach to sex drive has to do with three different things. So the first thing being biochemistry, which is testosterone, the hormonal need, but also estrogen, because we know that adequate estrogen will contribute to nitric oxide production and good boners. The second thing would be blood flow, which tends to be an issue more in varicoceles or older guys who maybe are smokers or in poor health where they have very poor circulation. And then the third thing would be the brain, meaning any type of threat or stressor to the brain. So anything that's going to affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis, that is training too much, training too little, eating too much, eating too little, emotional stress, physical stress, lack of sleep. All these things are a cumulative addition or like the allostatic load for the science geeks. No one seems to realize that that can play a tremendous role in someone's ability to obtain an erection and to have a high libido. And so the analogy that I like to use for fitness professionals and people who are in the gym is to pretend that you are, you're going for a one to three RM back squat. You are mid rep. It is excruciatingly difficult. You are grinding to get up. And at that moment, your love interest walks buck naked in front of you, winks at you and is like, yo, let's go. And I say, okay, do you think that you can really switch gears that quick and get a boner mid rep under, you know, 200 kilos? And most guys would say, yeah, no. And so that is very, very similar to stress's effect on the body, because if you're constantly in this fight or flight mode, your body's not going to be like, cool, bro, let's calm down, get an erection because we have to be rest and digest and parasympathetic to get an erection ejaculation is more sympathetic and fight or flight. So if we spend too much time sympathetically driven, which is stress, we're not going to be able to obtain that erection. And therefore we're not going to have a very high sex drive because subconsciously there's that fear of not being able to get a boner. And when I explain it that way, guys are like, oh, okay. Like I get it. Cause they don't think even if they don't feel stressed, there's a way to measure it. Your resting heart rate could be through the roof. Your HRV could be, you know, through the floor. And so understanding that effect on sex drive is huge because your body's not going to prioritize procreation if it's threatened in any other way. And during the pandemic or the start of the pandemic, because some countries are still in a pandemic, everyone was like, oh my God, I have testosterone problems. I can't get it up. My libido, it's shit. And I'm like, okay, hi. Look around you like we are going through a, a worldwide crisis right now because people are having financial issues or they're losing their job, but they didn't account for that as being part of like their, you know, sexual health. So when they understand that, yes, testosterone can be part of it, but it's not all of it, then it paints a better picture as to what is actually going on. And then they can tackle it from a different perspective. Absolutely. I'm really glad, yeah, that you sort of mentioning the multifactorial aspects to libido and obviously some of those key things you mentioned, I think a lot of guys just overlook, particularly the stress component, like the um, yeah. parasympathetic response, the HIV. What would you, I've got my numerous tools to improve HIV, but I'm curious to know about what, like how you approach that. So it's funny. Cause like there's some people whose HIV just never really gets up into, you know, the eighties or nineties above. And then they feel like, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, and I'm like, well, you have a pretty stressful job or that you just live at that. And, you know, like people whose resting heart rate really never gets below the sixties. Like that's okay. If 
you know, the sixties are where somebody lives, like that's actually not bad. So it's getting someone to take an inventory of what are they spending their time doing outside the gym? Because the gym is a stressor. However, it's also a form of stress relief for people. So what type of condition are they in and what is their training approach? And a lot of the times, they don't necessarily do what's necessary for their aerobic conditioning. And that's an often hugely overlooked aspect. And especially in the fitness world, because everyone's like, I don't need to do cardio. That's not cool. I don't want to look like a marathon runner. I can just do hit, you know? Okay. I went through that too. Like early 2000s, like psh, we could all do Tabata. We don't have to do, you know, long steady state. Like, I went through that. Okay. And now I can admit like, all right, we were kind of wrong because the quickest way to increase HRV, decrease blood pressure, decrease resting heart rate is aerobic conditioning. Cause we all learned in high school about the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell. And that's really all we remember, but it does allow us to utilize the food we eat a lot better and recover. And we're not going to turn into a marathon runner. So I don't know where that fear came from, but that was like really funny because it was always that one slide of like the skinny little white marathon guy next to the jacked black sprinter. And it was like, you could you get any different? And it was like, well, if you sprint, you're going to turn into this guy. And it's like, okay, no, that's not happening. And people were deathly afraid of becoming super, super skinny. Now, if you want to be skinny, cool. That's your thing. I don't care what someone wants to look like. But people tend to gravitate toward the sport they play because of how they're built. I will never play basketball. I am five foot three. I was good at soccer. So I look more like a soccer player. So people like that skinny runner's body or the petite runner's frame is because that person was born that way and they just become really good at that sport. Mm -hmm. So that whole fallacy, like it made me laugh. And this is a massive tangent on like aerobic work, but it just, it makes me laugh to this day. And then I'm like, how are we so blind when we learned everything in school and now we're preaching? Yeah, you can just do hit. But even more so nowadays with people are, you know, sitting overly stressed, hyperventilating as they sit, burning carbohydrates at rest. And we're telling them, yeah, just do the most intense, like stressful type of cardio and you'll be good. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. I think a lot of guys fear the aerobic conditioning just simply due to the fact that they're like depleting muscle glycogen so they look a little bit flatter and they think it's just absolutely killing their gains like maybe that's like one side of it i know and that's still an argument and my coach luke lehman came up with this term called least mode because he was you know seeing people doing hashtag beast mode hashtag fuck cardio like we don't need to do it and there was like this least mode approach where somebody actually needs more aerobic conditioning but he would explain it in the way where he would front load someone's program with aerobic work versus putting it at the end where a lot of people like physique competitors, especially to funnel calorie burn. And you're doing like two hours, which is like, I mean, who wants to do that? So if you start out aerobic, build a good aerobic platform, which only takes about eight to 10 weeks, and then you can maintain that with some higher intensity work. Versus right off the bat, throwing somebody into something that's going to send them into an, a more stressful environment. Like it's weird. And again, if you're an ultra endurance athlete, like if you said, Ali, I want to run from the East coast of the U S to California, I'd be like, okay, yeah, you might sacrifice some muscle and some testosterone, but most people are not running across their country <laughs> as their cardio. So I think we're okay. Exactly. <laughs> What about, let's sort of circle back. I'd love to dive deeper into some of the other hormonal cascades and maybe explain to my listeners that testosterone can get converted down maybe to estrogen, DHT, and then like specifically focusing in on low estrogen in men. So do you want to sort of expand upon that? So with low estrogen, guys tend to fear estrogen because it's like a female hormone and with testosterone, so testosterone being part of the hormonal cascade starting from cholesterol, testosterone can convert into DHT or estrogen. And DHT is the potent form of testosterone that gives, I always say gives us, but I'm not a guy, but I feel like I'm one of the bros. 
gives us our male secondary sex characteristics, V taper, facial hair, stuff like that. So if it converts to estrogen and that enzyme that does the conversion is blocked, then that's a problem because estrogen is neuroprotective, cardioprotective, boner protective. Guys will become very irritable, very low libido, very similar to low T and they won't be able to tolerate carbohydrates and they'll start gaining belly fat. And it's amazing the amount of men that have been prescribed something like a Rimidex or an Astrozole to block estrogen. When they come off of it, they feel so much better. They feel leaner. Like they just don't know why they take this medicine. You want to be able to trust the person prescribing it to you. But then they're like, oh my God. And you can show them like, there's a lot of literature showing the detriments to block estrogen in guys or to suppress it. But there's really nothing saying it is bad to have optimal levels of estrogen in guys. They just use this piece of paper, you know, at least in the US too. Excuse me. Oh, estrogen is red. That means it's high because it says high. It has nothing to do with what the patient feels. Mm -hmm. They don't go by any subjective feedback. It's like, oh, we have to block this because it's high on a piece of paper. Yeah. So our friend Gil made a great analogy on the TRT channel saying, trying to figure out how much estrogen a man is producing on paper via blood test is very similar to trying to determine how much money Bill Gates has just by looking in his wallet. So it's obviously just a fraction of it. So we really have no idea by looking at a blood lab and a lot of doctors will go by the labs for various things, but it's always like the hormones, you know, like we have to get this in a certain range. No, we don't. It's really more. How does the guy feel? Cause guys will freak out. They'll be like, my estrogen's a hundred. I'm like, how do you feel? They're like, I feel good. I'm like, what's the problem? <laughs> like, It's a hundred. I'm like, it's okay. You know, Obviously, I want them to be with a practitioner that doesn't make a big deal about it. Some of them don't even test estrogen at all. So then you can't worry about something you don't see. So that's kind of where like getting labs done can be a double edged sword because it's like a snapshot in time that if you actually were going to die just because of that estrogen number, you would have already died because it takes about a week for the labs to come back. OK, so, yeah. So dealing with that is huge to talk guys off a ledge because hey, the bodybuilding world is, is the world that made this a thing because they take such massive levels of testosterone and anabolics that they think, well, the greater, you know, these substances, the greater estrogen it must be producing. So that must be really bad. And a mm -hmm. lot of them now are having heart attacks and stuff like that. Probably contributing factor is crushing their estrogen so low. I remember even when I thought like one of my best girlfriends is a former IFBB pro and she would be on Arimidex and Tamoxifen and Aromacin, like what? And I was like, oh, maybe I need to do that too to get shredded. And I remember taking Aromacin, which is like the worst one that you can take, like cuts off all, all ability. And all of a sudden, like my glucose levels were really high. And I was like, why, why am I not tolerating carbs? I made myself insulin resistant. So I had to rectify that. And then I learned better. This was like 12 years ago, but you know, self-experimentation is a big part of this too. Cause if you've been through it, then you can understand, yeah, this makes no sense scientifically. So 100%. It, yeah. I, I can relate. Problem. I can relate there. I went through a period as well, Ali, whereas um, I maxed out my T like my T is like 988 nanograms per deciliter. That's quite high for, you know, I know it could be a lot better realistically, um, but Anyway, my estrogen was also quite high on paper, but I felt I felt bloody amazing. I felt awesome. I felt really good. And I went through a period of time where I was like, all right, let's acquire every single natural aromatase inhibitor, eat all the anti-estrogenic foods. Yeah. And I pretty much accumulated all these anti-estrogenic um, compounds in my body. And I felt terrible after one week of like, yeah, just smashing estrogen to the floor. I just felt... Horrible. Terrible. Yeah. And it's amazing because it's like guys become so attached to it, but they just don't know why, you know? And they think like anything surrounding like the breast or chest area, if they feel like a pain, oh, it's gyno. Like 
you know, oh, my nipple rubbed against my shirt. Oh, it's gyno. Like, what if your shirt is wool or it's like a terrible, like, you know, material or something like it's crazy. But I think that we're making strides with, you know, pushing against the nonsense and getting guys more educated. But literally every time I am on stage at a conference and I talk about this, some guy corners me and he's like pulling up his labs and he's like, so my estrogen's like 50 and I'm on a Rimidex. So uh, what do I do? Cause now it's like 15 and I'm like, okay, how do you feel? And he's like, I feel like shit. And I'm like, it's time yeah. to find a new practitioner. Like it's okay. It's crazy. Cause even um, there's some rat studies. I don't know if you've seen the male rat studies, but they literally administer estrogen, like estradiol. And these male rats become super horny and they just get their sex drive back. Yes, totally. And I've actually like listened to Neil Rousier, who is a big researcher on the, do you know him? He does um, courses yeah. in the U S and so he, he was talking about like the literature where they've given estrogen to prostate cancer patients. They've given estrogen to obese men to show that it does not push people in the wrong direction, that it actually can be beneficial. And it's like mind blowing, but some of those studies were part of what he was talking about and how like the rats were really horny and they had more life to them and everything. And it, it was like, it's crazy. And you don't want to believe it until you actually read it. Yeah. What about the next hormone DHT? I know this is another one that guys fear a lot. Like I'd love to hear your stance in terms of the importance of DHT like, do you care about the lab test results? Like, yeah, do you want to sort of expand upon that? From the practitioners that I've surrounded myself with, like the lab results are not really an alarming thing to them. If anything, I think guys fear surrounding it is because of how people say DHT causes prostate cancer, similar to estrogen causes prostate cancer. So everything must cause prostate cancer because it's like, what hormone are we left with that doesn't cause prostate cancer? So I think that they're fearing it for the wrong reasons. And also the hair loss is a big factor and, you know, that contributing to, again, another medication that you can block. But if you just Google post finasteride syndrome, that'll tell you all you need to know about blocking 5-alpha reductase, which is what converts testosterone to DHT. And it's crazy, like the amount of young men that are like, full head of hair like you and their dad lost his hair and they're like, well, I just want to do this for preventative reasons. And I'm like, Oh, and then they end up with like lower T they feel like shit. And I'm like, dude, or they end up like having issues peeing and it's all part of it. I'm like, do you understand you're basically playing with fire and you have to make a decision. If you are prone to losing your hair when you're older, shave your head, find a way to make yourself look good. Do not sacrifice your testosterone, your boner, your, your urethra, like everything, you know, manly just for the sake of hair. There's so many options now. Like Dave is very open about the micropigmentation he had on his head. And that's a great solution for guys whose hairline is a little bit misshapen or awkward, or maybe they don't like it. And then they have to end up with hair loss. Like my husband is slowly it's receding and he's holding on to like every hair on his Mohawk that he has. I'm like, just shave it. Like his dad shaved his head, you know? So if you're going to end up there, don't try to slow that process because again, don't block things like blocking things is a bad idea. We've realized this with statins and anti estrogens and anti DHTs and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think the consequences associated with some of those hardcore medications, like just destroying a man's quality of life. And, and even like you mentioned there, like both you and I know that there are guys that have used these medications and then stopped. And then even one year later, they're facing all these side effects, like even after withdrawal. Totally. And it seems like there was this big push for that maybe 10 years ago. Cause then that's when they came out with like Rogaine and like all these things. And I don't know a ton about those shampoos and stuff now, but like, I, it seems that we've kind of pulled the brakes on pushing that hardcore, but there are, you know, it, it's more to appease the patient. Like, I don't want to lose my hair. Okay. Here. <laughs> yeah. 
What about when it comes to like nutrition? I'd love to get your stance here, whether I'd love to learn about like how your approach to nutrition has changed over the years. So I used to be the person that was like, well, this worked for me and all my clients should do what I do. I literally was that coach who was like, you have to eat every three hours or your muscles will fall off and you've got to meal prep. I was like, oh my God, it makes me want to vomit. Like how awful that was. And I mean, again, I'm like 22, 23, like, you know, realizing your clients don't want to be you and they don't want to live your lifestyle is a big epiphany to have. And the earlier you can have it, the better, because again, they don't want to have veins on their abs. They don't want to be dick skin lean. Like they just want to like feel good in their skin and maybe have like one or two abs showing. So that is how kind of like the mindset toward it and meeting people where they're at is something that's changed. Cause since I've turned 40, I've now realized a lot of my friends who have children and their lifestyles and you know, what can work for somebody is not what's going to work for somebody else. And that's actually now what drives me crazy in these forums. Cause somebody will ask a nutrition question and it's like, everyone chimes in as to what works for them. And they're like, keto worked for me and this worked for me. And quite often it worked for them for like a period of time and then it stopped working. And so in my mind, if something worked past tense for you and you're not still doing it, it was not a sustainable approach. So I would say globally, I am very positive towards a higher protein approach because I think it solves a lot of issues. One of those being hunger, snacking, just like unawareness of how much somebody's eating. So all my clients, whether they're doing just a console or a coaching, being a coaching client, they will log their food on chronometer for a few days, just so I can see what their intake is like. I don't care where it comes from. I'm not judging you, whatever. So nine times out of 10, 9.9 times out of 10, the protein is not sufficient for what they're doing. And it's a huge, like, eye-opening thing. Cause I always ask someone, so what did you learn? If you've never tracked your food, what did you learn? They're like, how much I eat or how much I don't eat. And they're training like six days a week and they feel like shit. It's like, okay. So protein, at least body weight in grams, or if they're fat, like over 20% for guys, then lean body mass grams and protein, but it's always the higher protein approach. And then what their activity level and health situation is will dictate the carbs and fats. A lot of my guys tend to do very well on higher carb, lower fat. They just don't know it until they try it. Mm. So I have a lot of guys that are sub 20% body fat that are very active military veterans, you know, just like the type that will train a lot, but not sleep and not eat enough to support the training. So it's corralling them to realize why don't we reduce the amount of training, but just go harder and actually feed that. And then we can look at, you know, switching or adding training because they do just love training. And mm. more often than not, they're not eating enough or they're afraid. Like women, we are pegged with eat less body image issues, all that stuff. I will tell you from training men, you guys have the same type of, ho- of issues, I guess issue you can call it or drawbacks. Like we all have that. Guys just don't talk about it as much, but most of my guys don't like getting on the scale. They do fear the weight gain that will come from carbohydrates, even though it's water weight. They fear weight gain in general, especially if they're used to being a certain level of leanness. Because if you've ever dieted down, anything above that feels like you're obese. So I get it. So usually that's the approach that I'll take with them. Yeah, it's interesting. You're not the first person I've heard that's mentioned the benefits of, um, like, I'm sure did Luke Lehman talk about manipulating the fats and like actually lowering the fats. Like, what do you consider lowish on the fats in terms of grams per kilogram? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I I would say the lowest I've brought any of my guys down is around thirty five forty, and that's when they're dieting really hard. But traditionally, if they're higher carb, and in in my mind, that would be over 200 grams a day, roughly their fats are anywhere between 50 to 80, depending on their calorie level. So my guys who are very high calorie and upwards of four or 500 grams of carbs, again, you only need the fat to go so high. But if it's a lot of calories, 
you don't really need protein just as high because the, the carbs are protein sparing. So it's the calories have to come from somewhere so they can get away with over a hundred grams of fat or so, but you will realize like we swing hard in the industry with the pendulum and we got so infatuated with high fat and adding fat that we really don't need all this additional fat. Like you really could get away with fish oil and like essential fat and get pretty damn lean. But if you don't want to suffer and feel like miserable, then we will err on the side of probably 50 plus grams. But I do have guys that really want to get to that next level leanness. You have to go lower, but you don't stay there. That's the problem. Men and women, we will live there because we're like, oh, this works really well. Let's do this for 12 months. And then we feel even worse. (laughs) And as far as like the protein, I'm curious to know, like, like what's the max you've ever personally gone up to per day? Me, I think Luke had me around 200. So I'm around, I'm like 61 kilos now. And my like lean weight, I guess, is like 60.5. So I've got around 49 to 50 kilos of lean body mass, which is high from my height because I'm five foot three. So right now I'm at 155 grams of protein because we are reverse dieting because I did a photo shoot two weeks ago but I like protein. So if clients don't like protein or they don't enjoy eating a lot of it, it's going to be tough to get them to eat, you know, a good amount of it. I'd rather have a little bit higher protein and sacrifice some carbs just because I love protein. So Mm. some people are not used to it. So like, that's why having a food log is great. Cause if somebody's eating hundred grams of protein a day and they need 220, if I go to from 100 to 220, they're going to sit on the toilet for a while and be like, I hate you, Ali. So we have to get an understanding for this is a process and we're going to work up to it. But what it does for people is it helps keep them satiated. So they're less likely to snack and take in what I call air macros where they just forget to log it, but they've eaten like half a bag of pretzels and also take advantage of the thermic effect of food where it costs more calories to digest protein. So we might as well take advantage of that, especially if you're dieting. Cause if you're dieting, you do need higher levels of protein to mitigate any muscle breakdown and it'll keep you fuller, but you can actually burn calories by eating because you can overfeed protein and it's really not likely to be stored as body fat. Whereas eating donuts more likely, even though they're delicious. Yeah. <laughs> what about as far as like meal timing, Have you manipulated that in the past at all? With certain people, I find with my clientele, it's just hard for them to get their calories in. So sometimes, you know, I'm sure you have people who are like, I like intermittent fasting and it's like, okay, so why do you like it? Do you feel it does something magic or does it keep you structured or do you feel better? Half the time they have gut problems. So they feel better not eating. The other half of the time, they think it does something magical. So if somebody struggles to get their calories in, I don't think fasting is going to help them. So I will encourage them to spread those meals out appropriately, depending on when they train, you know, when it feels best. If somebody's like, hey, I eat one meal a day. Okay. Can we get all those calories in? Like I've had people like that before, but You know, I'm not strict with like, get this in at this time, unless they're extremely consistent. I won't do any carb cycling with somebody unless they're extremely consistent, because otherwise it's kind of a crapshoot. Like you're asking somebody to be diligent in hitting certain goals that are different on different days, and they can't even hit the same goal every day. So it's asking a lot. But as far as timing, you know, with workouts, unless they're training twice a day, I don't really make a big deal of it because I'm asking a lot throughout the rest of their day. But I tell them like, listen, try not to go like an hour after training without eating something, you know, because sometimes like we take that for granted as fitness professionals. We just assume people know to eat after they train because I think we're so hungry. But like people will go and have coffee. They'll go to a meeting and it'll be like six hours later. Like, yeah, I have lunch. And I'm like, you trained at 6 a.m but they just don't think to eat anything after. So it's like, you have to constantly remind yourself that the education of the basics are useful to a lot of people. For sure. For sure. What about as far as like, 
um, the biggest, let's say a man's looking to optimize his hormones, what would you say is the biggest mistake that men make when trying to like, you know, optimize their hormones? Probably sacrifice sleep for gym time or cardio or, or try fasting because they heard fasting increases testosterone. I don't know where that came from, but it, it's trying to implement everything and being consistent with nothing. So sleep usually goes kind of unaddressed because it's so boring and like no one really cares. But if you actually look at how we sleep and our routine before we sleep way different than like childhood, childhood, you're lucky to have a TV in your room. And now everyone's like, yeah, I fall asleep watching the TV. And I'm like, okay, that could be a reason why you wake up at 3 a.m. Or they're like, I drink alcohol because I can't calm down to get to sleep. And I'm like, alcohol does not help you sleep. It helps you pass out. And then you wake up at 3 a.m. and you wonder why. So understanding the cold, dark room and like eliminating as best you can any screen time. And I get that some people have jobs where they're dealing with different time zones and they have to be on the phone or whatever. All right, cool. Get blue light blocking glasses. Try to calm down any way you can. Read a book that has nothing to do with your profession and chill out. I mean, when's the last time you were bored and okay with it? Like I literally said to a client the other day, the average attention span of people is seven seconds. So people encourage you to make Instagram reels and TikToks that are like 15 seconds or less because you might get half of your message across to somebody seven seconds. So if we're not entertained within that time frame, you don't get, you know, the majority of your message across, like who's going to sit there and watch a one minute reel. And it's like, okay, cool. In the eighties, we sat on the porch, no phones, no TV, really maybe a radio, maybe a Walkman that was like this big. And you sat in like a rocking chair and you just watched the sunset. And it was like, who can do that now? Or if you like sit with no phone, you're really creepy. (laughs) (laughs) But like, if you think about it, when's the last time you were bored? Like you could not look at your phone or nowadays it's like, what TV program can I watch while watching my phone at the same time? (laughs) It's just the constant dopamine society we live in. And then they wonder why they have no like, you know, drive and motivation. It totally, totally makes sense. So Ali, what about in terms of, you know, my listeners, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of guys that want to like reach out and work with you. Where can they find you? I know you have your testosterone school as well. So maybe do you want to let my listeners know how they can connect with you? Yeah, I am always on Instagram. So at the Ali Gilbert, slide in the DMs. And please do not hesitate to ask questions. Like literally, it's such a sensitive topic sometimes with the men's health stuff that a lot of guys DM me. And they feel bad about it, but I realize how much courage it takes to actually ask these questions. So I really encourage guys to have that conversation with me if they are too shy to do it with a practitioner. At least I can kind of help bridge that relationship. So on there is where you'll find most of my content. I am on Facebook. I don't do a whole lot on Facebook. I think, you know, most of the kids these days are on Instagram. So (laughs) that's where they can find me. Awesome. Awesome. So I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes for my listeners, but um, Ali, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a, it was a great chat. Thank you for having me.